Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk, Wartime Cabaret, Remaking Theater from a Jewish Ghetto, features Dr. Lisa Peschel, Associate Professor in Theater at the University of New York, of York and she'll showcase how two teams of artists from Australia and South Africa reimagined a cabaret created in 1943 by Jewish prisoners in the wartime ghetto of Theresien, Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinikov people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, environmental, psychological, and economic impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Our event today is part of the 2022-23 KHC and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Trauma, Remembrance, and Compassion. It's also connected to the, K the Kupferberg Holocaust Center's latest exhibition virtual that's offered virtually and in person entitled The Concentration Camps, Inside the Nazi System of Incarceration and Genocide. Our event today is co-sponsored by the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, and the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center. After the presentation, please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at your, uh, featured on your screen. And now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming John Yi, one of this year's KHC NEH faculty fellows. John is a lecturer in the English department at Queensborough Community College and a doctoral student in English education at Teachers College at Columbia University. He teaches freshman composition, the accelerated program known as ALP, and an introductory course on Asian American literature. His interest is on culturally responsive pedagogy and on fostering a collaborative teaching and learning environment, particularly in digital spaces. He has recently co-published an article in the Journal of the Assembly for Expanded Perspectives on Learning. John, the floor is yours. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, lovely intro. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. So I'll, I will quickly introduce Dr. Pichel. Uh, Dr. Lisa Pichel is a senior lecturer, associate professor in theater at the University of York, England. Uh, she has been researching theatrical performance in the Terezin Stadt ghetto since 1998. Her articles on surviving testimony and scripts written in the ghetto have appeared in major theater and Holocaust-related journals in the U.S. and the U.K., and in Czech, German, and Israeli publications. Uh, she has been invited to lecture and conduct performance workshops at institutions in the U.S. and U.K., in Europe, South Africa, and Australia. Her anthology of rediscovered scripts, Performing Captivity, Performing Escape, Cabarets and Plays from the Terezin, Terezin, Stadt, Ghetto was published in 2014, Czech and German language edition, 2008. From 2014 to 2018, she was a co-investigator on the 1.8 million pound project, performing the Jewish archive funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Prashel. Thank you, John, for that very kind welcome. And it is absolutely my honor to be here with you today. I'd like to thank everyone and all the institutions who are helping to support this series. And also thank you for the land acknowledgement, which I find so important. So I'll begin. Five years ago, in July and August of 2017, I had the incredible privilege of working with two teams of artists and scholars, one at the University of Sydney in Australia and another at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, to reimagine a performance called Prince Betligend, 
which means the bedridden prince that was performed in the World War II Jewish ghetto called Theresienstadt in German and in Czech, Terezin, in 1943. So today I'll talk about how this project came about, also what we know about the original production that took place in the ghetto and about how two groups of collaborators, while working from the same songs and the same plot outline, created two different performances that brought Prince Betligen out of the past and into our present in ways that remain 100% true to the history, yet also embodied the present day concerns of each team. In Australia, that was the desire of the older generation to protect the young, and in South Africa, the intersection of race and power. The highlight of this talk for me is the opportunity to show you some video clips from each show. It's also the source of greatest stress. I'm just hoping that the tech holds up and you'll be able to see and hear these clips well. So I will move fairly quickly through the first two points so that we can spend more time with the performances. So in 2014, six colleagues and myself were awarded a 1.5 million pound grant from the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, the AHRC, for a project called Performing the Jewish Archive. This project was based on the research that we were all doing about music and theater by Jewish artists who, due to the rise of fascism, have been forced into exile or interned in the camps. As part of this project, we organized performance festivals in five countries, in the US, the UK, the Czech Republic, Australia, and South Africa. And in each country, we work with local organizations. This is just, these are just the logos of some of those organizations. So local universities, arts institutions, and artists to actually create the performance. It is my pleasure to introduce you briefly to the Australian and South African teams for the performance of Prince Betlik. And so this is the Australian team at the University of Sydney. Unfortunately, I won't have time to introduce you to every single one of them. I'll just point out a few. In the very center is our advisor, Edith Sheldon. She is a survivor of the Terezin ghetto who emigrated to Australia after the war and attended some of our some of our rehearsals to advise us about the history and about her personal experience with the cultural life. Uh, directly beside her is Joseph Toltz, our producer, one of my Performing the Jewish Archive colleagues. Directly behind Edith is Ian, who was our director. Um, the rest of the people, and again, I'm sorry, I won't introduce each individually, are our designers, our five actors, and the student orchestra directed by musical director, Kevin Hunt, who's just behind Ian. Uh, some of the student musicians, you can see them holding instruments off to the right. Down in front, right next to me is Katya, one of the actors, Gideon, one of the actors. I'll introduce you to more of them once we begin the videos. In South Africa, we worked at Stellenbosch University. And in Australia, we had, we had a smaller group of actors, five actors, but with a big student orchestra. In Stellenbosch, it was actually the opposite. We had a large student cast of nine actors and then a smaller student orchestra uh, led by Leonora Bredekamp. And Troy was the student leader. He's right in the center of the back row here. Director Imelda Brand is the third person from the left. And we had several designers, dramaturgs, and playwrights who unfortunately aren't in the photograph, but at least you can see all the cast members here. All right, I'll talk about their work in a moment, but first a bit about the 1943 production in Terezin. This is what Terezin looks like today. This is a modern day tourist map of the ghetto. It's a small town in the Czech Republic, about 40 miles northwest of Prague. It was built as a fortress town in the 1780s. And in this image, you can see these massive ramparts that surround the town. Some of you may already be familiar with works created in the ghetto, such as the Children's Opera Brundibar, or original musical compositions by Gideon Klein, Victor Ullman, Hans Krasse, and more. 
this cultural life was able to take place because conditions in Terezin were less brutal than in other camps. And I stress this is relative, less brutal than in the other camps for reasons that serve the Nazis purposes to facilitate the final solution. Terezin served mainly as a transit camp, as a place to gather the Jews of Central Europe, mostly from Czechoslovakia, Germany, and Austria, before sending them on to the death camps and slave labor camps further east. And these destinations, the Nazis carefully concealed from the prisoners. Although the prisoners did not know where the outgoing transports were going, they all feared them as a journey into the unknown and desperately tried to avoid being put on the transport lists. Because time is short today, I won't talk in more detail about the ghetto itself, but I do want to correct one fairly common misconception. The cultural life did not arise on Nazi command. It is true that it was co-opted by the Nazis on a few occasions. For example, for a visit by the Red Cross that took place in June, 1944, the commission stopped briefly at a performance of Brundibar, the children's opera. And there are other occasions that I could talk about. But for most of the ghetto's three and a half years of existence, the cultural life was run by the prisoners for the prisoners. The conclusion I've come to after 25 years of research and interviews with the survivors is that the cultural life was primarily important to them as a way to try to cope with life in the ghetto and to focus their attention and their talents at least for a few hours on something other than their Nazi overlords and other than the squalor of the ghetto, to focus on something from their pre-war lives, to focus on something beautiful, even something comical like Prince Betlegen. Prince Betlegen was written and performed in the spring of 1943 during an eight month period when there were no outgoing transports and the cultural life of the ghetto was thriving. The performance was created by a group of young Czech Jews led by these four prisoners, writer and actor Josef Pepik Lustig, actor Jerzy Spitz. After the war, he changed his name to Steffel. I'll be mentioning him a few more times in this talk. Designer and actor Otto Neumann and lyricist František Kovanitz. Unfortunately, František is the only one I have a photo of. This is his wedding photo from 1941. According to Jerzy Steffel, the one of the four who we know survived, we actually are not even sure whether Otto Neumann survived, but I could talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, according to Steffel, Lustig wrote Prince Betlegen as a satirical fairy tale with music intended to criticize favoritism and corruption in the ghetto. The plot revolved around the notion of being Betlegend, again, translated literally from German, it means bedridden. In most of the other camps, as you probably know from the history of sites like Auschwitz, being ill was in essence a death sentence. Terezin was different. In Terezin, in order to preserve the illusion of normalcy, the Nazis allowed the Jewish leaders to protect people who were ill from the outgoing transports and provide them with medical care in the ghetto hospitals. So let me summarize briefly the plot of Prince Betlegend. And the show opened with a jazz overture. We know this because one of the preserved pieces of music is called Overture to Prince Betlegen, that describes the history of Terezin from its founding in 1780, and then the establishment of the ghetto in comic terms. During this overture, the prince arrives in the ghetto. Shortly thereafter, we see a wizard cast a spell on the prince who then cannot get out of bed. A comic duo named Hocus and Pocus try to help the prince by figuring out how to break the prison's, or excuse me, break the wizard's spell. But at the same time, they realize that if they cure him, he will no longer be protected from the transports. Various misadventures ensue as Hocus and Pocus and the prince encounter fairy tale versions of the leaders of the ghetto the king, the princess, the ministers, etc. I'll mention just two events, which we'll actually see on video just uh, in just a few minutes. For example, at one point, the king offers the hand of the princess in marriage to whomever can cure the prince. 
And later in the play, the prince is saved from an outgoing transport, but someone else must go in his place. However, no one manages to cure the prince. Finally, a girl in the audience begins crying, distressed by the prince's plight. The other characters stop the play, look out into the audience and reassure her that the prince will remain bedridden and therefore all will be well. In the rousing finale song, the lyrics address directly to the prisoner audience encouragement for them to persevere. Now, the story that I've just related to you is our reconstruction of the plot based on fragments preserved from the ghetto. Lustig's original script was unfortunately lost, but here's what was preserved, the posters, the songs, and survivors' memories of certain key moments in the show. So let's take a closer look at the poster. This poster, which except for the title is all in Czech rather than German, names all the characters in the plot. This central block of roles and names relates, for example, the first character is the Kozelnik, a magician played by Otto Neumann, who's also the designer. The Bubenik, the drummer, was played by Milan Klinger, etc. So we knew what all the characters were. We knew what all the roles were that the prisoners were playing. But we also knew information about other contributions to the show. For example, these first four names near the top, the author is Joseph Lustig, the texts, texty lyrics are by Frantischek Kovenitz, whose photo we saw, costumes by Otto Neumann, and Hudba, music. Hudba is by Jaroslav Ježek, Jaroslav Ježek was not a prisoner in the ghetto. Who was Jaroslav Ježek? This is Jaroslav Ježek. Ježek is one of the best known Czech composers of the 1930s who wrote the music for the two beloved performers who are pictured here. On the left, Jan Verek, and on the right, Jerzy Voskovets. They were the comic duo who led the interwar liberated theater in Prague. And it is hard to overstate just how popular that theater was and how beloved it was by all Czechs, including the Czech Jews in the ghetto. So what Kovenitz as the lyricist did, he wrote terzine specific lyrics set to Ježek's jazz melodies, which almost all the Czech Jewish prisoners knew. So many survivors remembered the songs from Prince Betlig and, and wrote them down after the war. So those lyrics were preserved. In addition, three actors who survived in addition to Steffel gave testimony about Prince Betlig and describing specific plot points. This is Stenka Fontlova who actually played the role of the crying girl in the audience. So she provided us with some more detail. Another survivor named Gertrude Poparova told us that at some points in the show, the actors took on puppet-like movements. Another survivor named Evgen Foltine told us about a segment that is a takeoff on Hamlet, where one of the prisoners holds a dumpling in his hand and says to eat or not to eat. So from these kinds of fragments, we were able to put together an idea of the plot. I published all this information and the song lyrics in my anthology of the prisoners plays, Performing Captivity, Performing Escape, which was published in 2014, hoping that someday I'd be able to work on a reconstruction of the performance. And the Performing the Jewish Archive project finally, finally provided that opportunity. Just briefly, before I turn my slides off and start talking about the videos, if you are interested in this project, the edited volume, A Holocaust Cabaret, is coming out this summer. It includes both scripts and chapters by several people who worked on the project about their experience and will go in much more detail in a variety of voices about how we did this project. So before I show you some videos from the production, briefly, here's how they came together. Australia, 2017, I arrived in Australia in early July. By that time, Ian and Joseph and I had already discussed the plot outline and Ian had already cast the show with actors from Sydney's alternative theater scene who would be able to create the script by improvising around the plot outline. 
Most of the actors were in their 50s. Gideon, who played the prince, was in his early 30s. The theme that emerged through their improvisation was a combination of that accident of casting, so the age difference with the actors, and a historical truth of a ghetto, that the older ghetto residents and the Jewish leadership did everything they could to try to get the young people through the war. So for South Africa, in mid-July, we handed off our more detailed plot outline to the team in South Africa. They had a very different cast, a multiracial group of students at Stellenbosch University, led by Professor Imelda Brand. Now, I won't have time to do full justice to some of the issues they were facing at the time, but in brief, Stellenbosch used to be an elite, whites-only, Afrikaans language university where most of the apartheid era leaders were educated. Although Stellenbosch is now integrated, in 2018, just under 60% of the students were white. Racial tensions were still rife on campus. In fact, at that time, a recent incident of black facing on campus that happened a little bit earlier in 2017 had exploded into a discussion of racism and cultural appropriation which led our student cast to ask themselves, not one single one of us is Jewish. What is our right to engage with this script? With Imelda, they came to the conclusion, we have, the, we have to earn the right to engage with this by educating ourselves about the Terezine prisoners and by creating a show that is true to them and true to ourselves and our own history. I'm going to begin with the opening song from the beginning of the South African show, starting with the verse about Terezine, which the cast used as entrance music. I also wanted to say the sound is not always perfect on these recordings, so please do watch them to get an overall impression of the mood and the look of the scenes and take in the music rather than trying to follow every single word. Um, so this song is written to the melody of Yezhek's Civilization. I don't know how you reacted to the music, but I know that Ian, the Australian director, later told me what a surprise this song was. He never expected something so upbeat and so modern. So just a few things to note. You'll see that the students are all dressed at this point in 1940s clothing. Later, they make an overt transition to the world of the ghetto itself, the world of the fairy tale. And we'll look at a few of those scenes later. So now I'm going to switch to some video by the Australian cast. And they're going to pick up with the verse you just heard but we'll actually see the prince arrive in the ghetto. Atya and Yana, the two women, are playing the Hocus and Pocus characters. Robert Jarman is playing the king. Nigel plays a character we call the puppet master, and Gideon plays the newly arrived prince. So watch mainly what's going on in the action here. <laughs> A one potato meal. They had nothing else. It was a state of crisis, no drop of alcohol, and cash did not exist. Soon they started advertising, and soon the town was in the news. Not only in newspapers, but in the movies too.
Just a few things to notice. Note here the characters in white face makeup representing their fairy tale characters. This is something we actually borrowed from the conventions of the liberated theater. Maybe you noticed when I showed that photograph of Jezek that Voskovets and Varek are actually both wearing white face makeup. This presented some intense challenges for the South African cast. I won't talk more about that now, but if you'd like to ask about that in the q and I'd be happy to speak more. Um, also the concept of Nigel as a puppet master, you may have noticed his gestures kind of pretending to, to run the Hocus and Pocus characters. This is also from survivor testimony, the survivor who, who remembered the puppet-like movements the actors adopted in some moments. Uh, another thing you may have noticed in this scene, as the prince enters, the others are basically fleecing him, stealing his coat, his scarf, his other possessions as he arrives. This also presented an interesting problem for us based on the response of Edith, our survivor, to this scene. Again, I won't have time to discuss it right now, but if you're curious, please do bring it up in the question and answer. Okay, now we'll move forward to the next scene, which is about the song, The King's Speech. This next scene that I'll show takes place after the wizard has cast his spell on the prince and the other characters have realized that he is seriously ill, unable to get out of bed. The king decides that specialists will be called to try to cure the prince, and as a reward, whoever can cure him will receive the hand of the princess in marriage. The princess does not agree with this. This time I'll begin with the Australian version of the scene, with Robert Jarman again playing the king. Watch for the transition from the comic mood in his interactions with Nigel as the princess to the song. Yes, we'll call specialists, and the fact will compete to cure him, and whoever can cure him, I will reward magnanimously with the richest treasure that I own, the hand of my daughter, Princess Privilege, in marriage. They shall be her suitors. Oh, privilege! <laughs> you speaking as your king see the signs of age that the attempt to serve you brings but all you know is how to take give something back for all our sakes that's all i ask of you that's all i ask of you and I will always stand beside you, although nation mine, everything I do for you, you only criticize my government. It does its best, slaps in the face are all we get, we are undermined, we are much maligned. This song, this particular song has always fascinated me, mainly because the survivor, Yerzy Steffel, remembers the play and this song in particular as a harsh critique by the prisoners of their Jewish leaders. But when I finally obtained the lyrics to the song, I could see they show a fair amount of sympathy for the position those leaders are in. And Robert, 
as an actor, invested it with an impressive degree of dignity. And I'd also be happy to talk in the Q&A about the process of working with him on this song. But let's take a look at the South African version. In that version, I'll pick up from where the princess, this time played by Anya Larissa, is defending herself from her father's plans to marry him all, her off. Note that they're all now in full fairy tale makeup. And the main characters here are the king, played by Morella, and Hocus and Pocus by Devonisha and Brayton. So I will cue up that video. This younger cast did a much more humorous take on the king with, especially during this first verse we watched, the characters fairly openly mocking him with their choreography and the yada yadas. Nevertheless, this young woman, Mirella, playing the king over the course of the song slowly does gain a kind of dignity. Okay, the last scene that we'll look at is one around a song called My Suitcase and Me. And we'll look first at the Australian scene. So I'll cue, oops, cue that one up. This scene takes place after the hospital orderly played by Nigel, who here is playing the princess, we'll see him play the hospital orderly in a moment, decides that what the prince needs to cure him is food. The scene evolves from a comic take on the to eat or not to eat line that one of the survivors remembered to a profoundly melancholy solo when Nigel's character is assigned to a transport. When I cue up this scene, notice as well how the band gets into the act with the sound effect to represent the transports and the moment when they actually interact with the characters by delivering the transport list to the actors. So let me go to this scene. That is the question. I've got it. I'll have my dumpling and eat it too. I'll eat the dumpling, and then I'll get better, and then I'll pretend to be sick. Like this. Oh, come on. You think no one's ever thought of that before? I can play sick on the great doctor. No. You have to be actually sick. Remember the last guy who tried. Delivery. Oh. Oh, 
the lift for the transport. 500 able-bodied men. Your name is on it. Where's this one going? It doesn't say. But he can't go, he's still sick. Well, someone will have to go in his place. Off you go then. Food service, I've got protection. I'm sick, I'm in bed leaving. No, well, I don't. I'm the king. This is another song that I find absolutely remarkable, My Suitcase and Me, that the singer describes the experience of being moved here and there, of thin skin covering a frame, this constant parallel between my suitcase and me. It's set to a, to a melody by Yezhik called The World Upside Down. We see the loneliness of this character in this moment of his solo, Yet there's something about the steady beat of the song that keeps that emotion contained. Now let's see how that emotion is expressed in the South African version. In this version, it also shows this moment of the hospital orderly, here played by Angelique, being assigned to a transport. But instead of performing it as a solo, she is joined by the entire cast. The prince, played by Conradi, the king, the princess, Hocus and Pocus, who we've already met, the ministers played by Anka and Tina, and even the wizard played by Jodeci. So we'll listen to a bit more of the song in this version. Again, the scene begins with a comic entrance, this time by Hocus and Pocus, but then again transitions into this profoundly mournful song. So let me cue this up. Men have to guard on transport. And there's only one spot left. I'm the princess. I'm not 
to be sure to leave enough time for questions. So I'll end this talk with just a few remarks on this particular scene. This is one of the moments when the South African cast was true both to the Terezin history and true to their own. During apartheid in South Africa, there were times when non-white people were forcibly removed by train from certain areas that up until that point had been somewhat integrated in order to create whites only areas. As Imelda, the director told me, it would have been impossible for a South African audience to watch this scene and not think of this crime from their own history. So in this moment, the entire cast is on stage all mourning this past together. I will stop sharing now and thank you very much. Wow, so much to take in. Uh, thank you for that beautiful um, presentation, Dr. Prashal. It's a lot to think about. Um, so wonderful how you kind of orchestrated and looked at the specific productions right, all across different um, areas in the world. Um, I'd like to open this uh, Q&A up. So if you have a question, feel free to leave one uh, for Dr. Prashal. We can try to get to your question. Um, I think I'd be remiss not to think of like how your your research sort of fits into Holocaust studies because I think immediately I don't think of cabaret in Holocaust studies and I would really love to know um, how you got into this uh, really compelling and intriguing area of research. Um, what what got you started, wartime cabaret, oh, sir? It was it was actually a very specific moment. I went to Czechoslovakia during that period, shortly after the Velvet Revolution, when lots and lots of young Americans were going to Prague to teach English. I went there in 1992, but I ended up in a smaller city called Tabor, which is about an hour and a half south of Prague. But one of the times when I went to visit Prague, I went to their Jewish museum, which is a fantastic institution. And there I saw some drawings by kids from Terezin. And at first, <laughs> because of the way they were placed, at first I actually thought these drawings were by children from some local school. And it was only when I tried to read the captions, which were in Czech, that the dates, the wartime dates became apparent and this name, Terezin, Terezin. And I realized, okay, these were kids who were caught up in the Holocaust. And just a few months later, again, on a trip to Prague, somebody put a flyer in my hand for a CD of music by the Terezin composers. And I thought, what kind of place was this? That kids are producing drawings, that composers are creating new works of music. And that was really the moment that it lodged in my mind. But it actually, it wasn't until five years later when I decided to get a master's degree in playwriting that this theme came back to me. I decided to try to write a play about it and I've been researching it ever since. Well, thank you so much for that. So I imagine that the, the drawings and images probably stuck with you all those years as you were they, revisiting the topic. Yeah, they, they very much did. And one of the remarkable things was, I have to say, I, I think I had heard somehow about the Terezin's children's before, or yeah, the Terezin children's drawings before. So although they were surprising, it wasn't a great leap for me to think, well, of course they, they if they had any resources at all, they would have tried to distract the children in some way. But it was when I realized about the art of the adults that I really took notice. And a lot more work has been done on the music of Terezin. The research about music is still in its fairly early stages, but the imagery from that has lodged just as much in my mind because there's an incredible collection of souvenir posters that were preserved by the administrators of the ghetto themselves. And this is now available to researchers. A few of the images that I showed today are from that collection. Wow, thank you so much for that. Um, really, really interesting. Um, 
I, I think we're getting a question regarding um, the audience. So how did prisoners get the privilege to see the shows specifically? This is an excellent question. And part of this, part of the answer depends on the way that Terrazine was structured in a way very different from most of the other ghettos and camps. Um, all, all the adult prisoners had to work, but they did have time free in the evenings. For example, people who worked in the bakery would work from about 4 a.m. early, as bakers do, until maybe 4 p.m., but they would have some time, some free time in the evening. During most periods of the ghetto, there was also a curfew, but there were a few hours there where people would actually be able to go to shows. There was a very carefully managed ticket distribution system, and I'm still doing some research on exactly how that worked, but in brief, some of the tickets were distributed to the young workers of the ghetto. That was a relatively privileged group because the ghetto depended on them for their labor, but it was also possible to spend ghetto money. There was actually money printed in the ghetto and a lot of these bills have been preserved and are valued by collectors. You could actually spend ghetto money to try to get a ticket, but there was so much demand that this was a difficult thing and actually a privilege to be able to get a ticket and go to one of these shows. Thank you so much for that. And I, I think uh, another audience member has, I guess, a follow up to that. Um, I suppose that example that you used with the South African uh, production and how there were racial tensions, particularly around the white face. I think they ask, uh, could you elaborate a little more on that? as well as the political discussion and maybe controversies that the production encountered in staging mm -hmm. that particular area of the world. Yeah, I'll speak about this white face situation. It was this notion of the makeup was extremely fraught for the South African cast because they did a lot of research. They looked into the theater of Boscovitz and Berwick and just how influential that had been upon the Terezin prisoners. But because this incident of black facing had been so controversial and so inflammatory on campus, they thought, you know, boss, uh, the Boscovets and Barrett characters, these hocus and pocus characters were going to be played by black students. So they thought, how can we do the opposite? I mean, how can we, even though we can historically justify it, if we come out with white face makeup, this is going to be so inflammatory that people are not going to pay attention to other aspects of the show. So they decided instead to just do kind of heightened clown makeup with the accentuated mouths and the, the pronounced eye makeup, but they didn't try to do the white face. And the sh this show received two performances during our festival, one at Stellenbosch and one at a, at a small theater in Cape Town. And it was very well received. People didn't object. No one in the audience brought up the issue of, you know, this is some kind of cultural appropriation. They were actually just much more interested in the history of the ghetto and the students clearly deep emotional engagement with the topic. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I suppose the beauty of is that improvisational aspect, right? The, the aspect of, okay, like you can change and sort of edit around things that maybe may work or may not work, right? It, yeah, absolutely. And we had the advantage, the strange advantage in this project that we didn't have the original script. So we weren't bound. We did feel bound to certain plot points that we knew had taken place because just a sense of obligation to the original artist. But because there were so many gaps in that script, we were able to fill it in a way that remained true to the history and was based on our research, but yet took into account the current concerns of our audience. Yeah, wonderful. And, and kind of like to touch on that, um, obviously a big reason why I wanted to talk to you uh, is this very notion of like compassion, humanity. Um, as well as kind of examining optimism, right, within a, a period of such darkness and destruction, um, could you speak to notions of some of these elements uh, as it may be presented in your work? I would be happy to. A lot of my work is about the role of the arts as a way to try to cope with potentially traumatizing experience. And I've got several articles already published about this, but one of my goals within Holocaust studies is to try to expand the breadth of types of emotion that we look at in the ghetto. There's been so much focus for, for completely understandable reasons on trauma. 
and trauma studies was just kind of becoming, was kind of coming into its own as a field. As I started this project back in the mid nineties, it's still going strong. But one of the things I'm trying to do in my research is say, we need to look at, at the prisoners as, as complete people. And in the case of Terezin, some of them were there for three and a half years. This could not have been an unmitigated experience of trauma and terror. How did they, with their own modest resources, create ways to have other experiences in the ghetto, the human experiences of, of happiness, of laughter, of feelings of solidarity with the other prisoners? Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we're getting two questions uh, in the Q&A. So why did they arrange the shows for the prisoners? Uh, any specific reasons? And were the Nazis completely ignorant of the resistance marked in the musical efforts? Um, I know we're we're getting close to time here, so I'll be brief, although both these questions are worth a, a, a long time. Um, so the first was why the Nazis allowed it or why the performances were provided? Yeah, I, I suppose, um, I guess what the purpose was around arranging these shows for prisoners. Um, yeah, yeah. That was uh, maybe a student question. And, and yeah, then... no, it's, that's, that's an excellent question. And then I'll talk briefly about the notion of resistance. The, the performances began on the initiative of the prisoners. When you look at other camps, for example, when you look at the Westerbork transit camp in Holland, that was really initiated by the commandant because of his own interest in theater. But in Terezin, it was initiated by the prisoners. We actually have a poster, actually just a typewritten agenda that survives from the very first performance, which was a very modest kind of cabaret type performance that the prisoners put on in the barracks. And it quickly became a apparent that you know, this is a tremendous boost to the morale of the prisoners. So they kept doing it at first in secret. And then the Council of Elders, the Jewish leaders actually decided, you know, we, we need to we need to acknowledge this is happening because we don't want the prisoners to be caught and punished for this. So they asked the Nazi leadership for permission and that permission was granted. So in a, in a completely acknowledged way, the theater scene grew. It didn't have to exist in secret. However, there were a lot of signs of resistance, jokes that were included in these cabarets, but were carefully disguised so that the Nazi leadership didn't find out about them and punish the prisoners. And I could go on more about this topic of resistance, but it does look like we're almost out of time, but thank you for that question. Thank you so much. And I, I suppose we can just quickly end with uh, like, what are some current projects you're working on? I know that you mentioned the Holocaust 2000, summer 2023. Uh, how can we follow up on that and, and sort of follow you? Yeah, I, I understand my staff webpage is going to be posted and I will update it. I promise it needs updated and I'll update it so you can see more of these things that are coming up. But uh, just briefly, I'm working on my first monograph. This is my first solely authored book. I've done several edited volumes, but my first solely authored book. And in that book, I'm going to be looking at a range of survivor testimony, tracking five survivors over 60 years, multiple examples of testimony, ranging from the 1940s to the interviews that I did myself in 2004 to 2008, where they talk in detail about what it meant to them to participate in these performances, both as performers and as audience members. Fantastic. I hope to, I hope we can find some opportunity to invite you back and maybe speak about that once it's completed. But thank you I so much, for time, Dr. Prishal. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I think that that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending. I think Dr. Cohen may, may have some closing remarks. I just wanted, um, Dr. Peschel, thank you very, very much, John. Thank you so much also for moderating today. I had actually visited Teresian many years ago, and it was well before I was in this, this field. And um, I think the thing that I was taken with initially was going into the town because the there's a concentration camp on the outskirts of town. And I remember the first time I walked into sort of the, the sort of the fortress entrance where the, the town where you go into it, someone waved out a window. And it was the first time I really confronted what it's like for people to live in a space where atrocities took place. 
in the past. And also um, this Sunday, we're screening at the Museum of the Mo uh, Moving Image in New York City, something called the German Concentration Camp Factual Survey, which is footage of the allies, um, what they encountered when they got into the camps. It's very, very gruesome. And the reason I mention that is because your presentation today has very much been about life. And it's been amazing to listen to the artists making these connections between the past and the present and bringing this material and life and resistance into our contemporary society. And I think that that's something very significant in the field of Holocaust education that we're really wrestling with. And I also very much appreciate the conversation about how this was um, received in South Africa with the legacy of apartheid and how people um, could really place themselves in a way in, in these performances. So thank you both very much. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. We're very grateful. And on behalf of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, we hope you stay safe and well. Thank you.